we go. So this will be a short presentation to explain tuberculosis in lions with particular reference to captive bred lions and the health risks to humans. Um, I've explained here just basically because I talk about both forms of tuberculosis um, in the presentation. So mycobacterium tuberculosis is the common one um, found in humans. So when somebody has TB, that's, that, that's the one that we normally talk about. Mm -hmm. Mycobacterium bovis, which is bovine tuberculosis, um, is the one um, that has zoonotic transfer um, from wildlife to humans. Um, and it is a, a drug resistant form. You'll see that I, I talk about both of them, but this is just to, to give you um, an idea of what I'm talking about. So over many years when visiting captive lion breeding facilities, i would noticed the number of lions that had lumps on their elbows. Often there would be a group in one cage and, and none in another, and I wondered why. The stock answer from the breeders was always because the lions lay on the ground. And that never rang true for me because A, it did not explain why only certain groups had them, and B, lions in the wild do not carry yoga mats when they go to the bush. So it just, it was farcical. Um, and, and for me, there was something that was not right. So the, the first um, picture in the slide here, this is a wild lion um, in the Kruger Park. Um, it was an adult um, that was tested for TB, and you can see this lump, this hygroma on the elbow. Um, this one here is a young um, uh, lion at a very well-known uh, captive breeding farm in the Northwest province, and already it's showing signs of, um, of a big hygroma. Um, and and this, this is what I was picking up all the time in these um, captive breeding farms. So in, in um, 2016, um, I eventually started researching to find out more and discovered that these lumps called hygromas are a reliable early indicator of M. bovis infection. The research resulted in the publication of our paper, Dying from Myth, and we are indebted to Professor Paul van Helden of Stellenbosch University Professor Nick Creek of Pretoria University, Professor Urban Modlin, Emeritus Professor, Yale University School of Medicine, and Dr. Kurbis de Toy, Wildlife Vet, for their assistance and advice. Um, if anyone doesn't have this paper, I'm happy to email it to them. Um, otherwise, you can uh, find it on our Facebook page. It's pinned right at the top. Our Facebook page is at Voice for Lions. In um, Professor Modlin's um, uh, statement to me is included in the paper, but one thing I just wanted to show here from that, he said, I would be extremely confident based upon the information you relayed to me that the export of infected lion carcasses would represent the potential for introducing a tuberculosis epidemic in a group of individuals working with that material such individuals would become the unwitting vectors for the distribution of tuberculosis imported from one country and then distributed in another. Sadly, the disease would not be selective for only those ingesting the powdered bone, but all those healthy persons that they were inadvertently in contact with in the normal course of their daily life. Professor Paul van Helden, who um, also assisted with the paper, stated, it should be noted that the organism that most commonly causes Lyme TB is Mycobacterium bovis, which causes bovine TB. This differs very slightly from the species most often causing human TB. Unfortunately, this organism has the propensity to cause TB in humans, often in organs other than the lung, making it very difficult to diagnose. Furthermore, it is inherently resistant to one of the four most important drugs used to treat primary human TB. Treatment of humans with this form of TB is therefore compromised. This therefore poses a potential risk to humans, which is arguably greater than the most common form of TB in humans. He went on to say, I am therefore of the opinion that uncontrolled exposure of humans to bones from animals, in particular lion bones, poses a risk for development of the form of TB known as bovine TB in particular, 
although not necessarily being limited to this form of TV only. In July 2009, uh, Prof Van Helden was featured in an article on Thomson Reuters Science Watch, and they cited him as the fourth highest ranked scientist in the world in the field of tuberculosis. Um, as I say, all, the, um, all these um, professors who, who assisted with this paper, I don't think we can ignore um, their findings. Animal TB, termed zoonotic TB, poses a greater threat to human health and the economy than previously thought, according to a report published in the medical journal, The Lancet Infectious Diseases, in October 2016. This is the first time veterinary scientists, along with leaders of major global health and agricultural agencies, have come together to cause for a call for a coordinated international response to zoonotic tuberculosis, said Colorado State University's Dr. Francesca Oleo Pop Elka, lead author of the Lancet report. According to the International Union Against Tuberculosis and Lung Disease, while conventional TB is caused by the bacterium Mycobacterium tuberculosis, zoonotic TB is caused by Mycobacterium bovis and poses unique, unmitigated risks to public health, to food supplies, and to the agricultural sectors of the global economies. From a public health perspective, it's imperative to understand, recognize, and address the challenges faced by TB patients infected with M. bovis as patient treatment and care differ in comparison to the most common form of TB caused by M. tuberculosis. For example, M. bovis is not naturally resistant to pyrazinamide, one of the first line medications in the standard treatment regimen of TB, whereas zoonotic TB caused by M. bovis in humans is more commonly associated with extrapulmonary rather than pulmonary TB. Um, and that's the scary thing because it, the extra pulmonary, it's, it's elsewhere in the, in the body and, um, and, and very difficult to discover. Furthermore, the epidemiology and most common transmission dynamics of M. bovis differ significantly from those of the airborne disease caused by M. tuberculosis. Using pyrazinamide to treat patients with bovine tuberculosis increases the risks of treatment failure and of patients developing resistance to other TB medicines. Possibility of infection becomes a major risk factor for anyone on, who is on medication that is an immunosuppressant or has an inherited or acquired immunodeficiency disorder, for example, HIV uh, infection or other factors, but not limited to those with low socioeconomic status, crowded living conditions, etc. There's also the issue that once a person catches TB, it can lie dormant for a number of years whilst it multiplies in the body. And once the disease is activated during this time, they are likely to infect other members of their family, as well as friends or anyone they may be in contact with, since the disease is normally passed from human to human via the respiratory system. So you can see by that that um, uh, they will be uh, infecting people and they don't actually even know that, uh, that they're ill. TB in lions can also lie dormant and become full-blown under stress. Um, and I have a whole story around that. If we have time at the end, um, I, I, can, I can explain that to you. Once infected, a lion can shed the virus in aerosols um, because that's the, the method of disbursement and infect other members in the pride due to their highly social nature. So if you think about lions, um, they're always together, they're always in a clump, even, uh, even when they feed, there's, there's a big, um, big group of them. Um, and infected lions may, uh, may show signs of progressive weight loss, poor healing, skin wounds, joint swellings, uh, muscle loss and eye lesions. Loss of mane and testes atrophy are also found. So this particular line, this photograph was taken in um, the Kruger Park um, in October. Um, you can see clearly uh, the, the hygroma on his elbow. You can see where he's losing his mane. Um, the picture's not that clear, but he has lost a lot of fur on his body. Um, the hygroma here on the on the hip joint is um, is starting to come. He actually looks like he's got um, testicular atrophy as well, um, and even the tail um, is is kind of sparsely furred. 
So the interesting thing, um, when TV research was first done on, on lions in, in the wild a number of years ago, um, because we, we do have that problem, um, they were saying that hygromas on the elbow were found on the females and lumps above and below the hip joint are what was found on the males. Um, now the males have both, so both either or. Um, so it, it seems to have changed a little bit. This line, obviously, um, poor soul Besom is um, not going to make, make it much further. So disease risk assessment um, carried out in Kruger National Park in 2008 found that once individuals are infected, the rate at which they become diseased and how many infected animals do not get to the disease state needed to be determined. It was agreed that 20% remain latent or non-diseased, and of the approximately 80% of lions that became infected, all became infectious in a five-year period. So here is it just shows you the uh, the extent of uh, you know what what they end up looking like. Um, this was a lion um, photographed actually by my son in Tshuli um, um, Falozi Park in KwaZulu Natal. Um, was taken quite a few years ago. Um, this had been quite a healthy pride um, and some stressor must have occurred and all of a sudden they all started looking like this. Um, I think there was there was four or five in the pride, it wasn't a big pride, um, and they eventually all died. But it, it's quite a, um, this is the, the, the least offensive photograph that I could find of her um, and you can see here, if you, oh, sorry, um, here you can see how, you know, these wounds just ooze and, um, and it's just, it's horrible to look at. So many of you will have seen photos on social media of lions in the wild in an emaciated state. And perhaps that's what you imagine lions with TB will look like. This is actually the end stage. And here we have end stage. This was um, Melanes and Kruger. Um, you can see uh, her tail has, oh, I keep doing this, absolutely no fur. She's got very little fur on her body. There's the, the hygroma on her elbow. Um, she's wasted away to absolutely nothing. By the looks of, of um, this, she's, she's been eating grass. Um, it, it's, even her ears are, are worn away. It's it's a really, really sad sight um, to see. I can't actually remember, this was in 2017, and I don't actually remember if she was euthanized or, um, or if they found her like that. I have a feeling that they actually euthanized her, but to have suffered to get to that state was, was quite awful. Professor Michelle Miller um, says that the problem with tuberculosis in wildlife is that the animals do not show the typical signs of disease, such as weight loss, loss of condition, and lethargy until the disease is advanced. The progress of disease in lions is relatively slow, with the majority of infected lions appearing healthy while being subclinically infected. And that's an important thing to, to bear in mind. Um, keep in mind that captive bred lions do not make old bones, if you pardon the pun, and need their end as trophies and for the bone market long before they are showing signs of anything other than hygromas and possibly even before then. Um, this was a, a group of lions that I photographed um, also in Northwest Province. I think there were eight in this particular camp. Um, all of them had hygromas. You can only see um, them in the ones that are standing up, um, there's one there. Um, there were also, um, here yeah, you can notice it in, in, in this one, there were um, abnormalities in, in the bones, so they kind of stunted in growth. So there was obviously a lot of inbreeding going on. Um, and this, this was a particularly interesting um, facility um, because you would go row upon row of these enclosures and you'd find a group like here of seven or eight all having hygromas. You'd go to the next lot and there wouldn't be any there. That's not to say that those ones that didn't have any um, 
were not carrying TB, but they weren't at that stage showing the signs. Um, so, and, and they were all lying on the same ground. Um, I mean, that was the enclosure. They were all the same. So if it was a case of this was caused by them lying on the ground, why did they have them and, and why did the next ones not? Um, and, and to point out as well that captive bred lions are not tested for TB. Um, the, the breeders are always trying to cut corners wherever they can. They don't like spending money. And to test a, a lion, you, you need to um, sedate them and then you've got to have the vet to do the test and so on. So they don't bother. Um, so these lions are being shot. They're going into the bone market. They're going out as trophies um, untested. And that's the really scary thing. This was a, um, a, a also in Kruger, um, a line being tested for, for TB. You'll notice this little crescent shaped mark on the, on the hip here. When you see it in lines in the wild, um, it means that they have had a TB tissue test. Um, so they, they um, inject TB under the skin as one of the, um, and, and then look for a reaction as one of the things they do. But where there is a suspect of, of um, something going on, you'll get, and, and there's always, they take tissue and there's always that little crescent shaped mark that's, that's left. Um, according to research done on wild lions in Shishlu Yamphalozi Park in KwaZulu Natal, it was discovered that inbreeding depression increases susceptibility to bovine tuberculosis. And inbreeding and stress are highly prevalent in the captive bred lion industry. I don't think it, it's more prevalent than in that industry. So it makes it a perfect breeding ground for um, bovine tuberculosis. I'm going to show you a couple of gruesome uh, things just to give you an idea of, of the disease. This is a cross section um, of a lion in, in Kruger that these white things, um, this is the spinal cord and these are TB lesions on the spinal cord. So the pain that this animal must have been in, it defies belief. Um, we would also presumably have the same things if we got the TB in our spinal cord. I, I mean, I can't even think what it must feel like. This is uh, also Kruger, um, uh, a lion. Um, this was the leg. So you look at the, the, how the joints are destroyed, how the bone is just eaten away by TB. Um, also incredibly, incredibly painful. And you're not seeing this from the outside. So you'll only see um, a hygroma, but this is going on in the bones inside the animal. So what often happens if, if they have to run, if they're even capable of running, is because, because the bones are being eroded by TB, they actually get fractures. So then they can't move at all. Um, and, and as I say, this, that this is going on inside the body and you're not seeing it. Um, and do we want to put ourselves at the same risk? So um, we had a parliamentary portfolio committee um, uh, in um, 2018. Um, they, they convened a colloquium and um, on, on really it was, it was to do more with lions than any of the other wildlife. And um, we su submitted to them um, the, uh, a paper to say that the risk uh, that South Africa is import exporting TB and lion bones is very real. Um, and we stated that the precautionary principle should certainly apply. Um, and now, of course, with the coronavirus outbreak, um, that principle should apply twice over. So I just included here because it's interesting. The EU in, in, in 2000, uh, the de definition of the precautionary principle, um, the precautionary principle applies where scientific evidence is insufficient, inconclusive or uncertain. And preliminary scientific evaluation indicates that there are reasonable grounds for concern, that the potentially dangerous effects um, on the environment, human, animal, or plant health may be inconsistent with the high level of protection chosen by the EU. Um, after the, um, the colloquium, um, which was August 2018, 
the um, Portfolio Committee um, produced their report back and their recommendations to Parliament in November 2018. The report back was really damning of the entire industry and the recommendation was that it, was, it should be closed down. Um, for the purposes of this talk, the most important section of that report back was 7.9. Um, which stated that the risk of human health and safety posed by zoonosis, an infection or disease that is transmittable from animals to humans under natural conditions, including tuberculosis, and I'll skip the rest, um, and then the risk to South African lion abattoir workers is, is real. South Africa also risks finding itself in a precarious legal position should it arise that the country had exported tuberculosis infested lion bones. Um, interestingly enough, after that uh, report to Parliament um, was tabled, the Minister of Environmental Affairs just turned her back on it and um, went ahead and um, called for the, uh, uh, a high level panel to be convened to chew the fat over the same subject that we've been talking about year in, year out. Um, and the high-level panel was um, very uh, biased in favour of um, the hunting fraternity and the breeders. Uh, we did a written submission to the high-level panel. I also did an oral submission to them last year, uh, uh, last uh, in October, um, and, and answered a whole lot of questions that, that they put to me. Um, they have until the 15th of this month to present their findings to the minister. Then, of course, we have Christmas and parliamentary closed down and things move very slowly in South Africa. So I don't expect that anything's going to come out um, from the minister for a couple of months. Um, we actually don't even know if she's going to share that um, report. Um, and there have been no definitive studies carried out on how long the bacterium remains alive in bones or other body parts. Mention is made of periods anywhere from six weeks to six months, but much will depend um, on the period, on the method of preparation. According to Professor Modlin, both ingesting and inhaling will cause different strains of TB and cancer. Tom Frieden, the head of Center for Disease Control in the Obama era, said that the dry TB bacilli can live in the pages of a book for up to seven years. So that's actually quite a scary thought. At the end of 2014, um, there was a shipment of 92 lion carcasses that was impounded by the state vet at ORT Airport in Johannesburg. The lions were all young and had only been cleaned with ethanol so there was a lot of tissue still on the bones. The state vet's concern was a health one. So this, um, this, this head here was part of that shipment. The whole shipment looked like this. You can see how, uh, how much um, tissue and so on is still on there. What the state vet's health concerns were, um, I never did find out. I had a meeting with um, officials from, um, from ORT. Um, they gave me the photographs and, and some information, but didn't divulge that. What was really interesting, that was at the end of, <coughs> excuse me, 2014. Um, so the shipment's impounded because the state vet has concerns. Uh, January 2015, all of a sudden, the shipment's released and it's on its way to the east. How did those concerns suddenly change from one month to the next? Because nothing had changed, everything looked the same, and one can draw your own conclusions as to how that shipment was allowed to leave. Um, and I asked Professor Creek about um, using ethanol and, and if that would kill the bacterium. And he said that the crux of the matter would be the concentration used, and if it was insufficient, the process would be ineffective. Well, we, we know that these guys cut corners, as I said, so I imagine that the concentration is extremely diluted. Workers in the abattoirs and taxidermists do not wear any protection equipment and would most certainly be inhaling the bacterium whilst they are handling the bones. These workers are for a large part immunocompromised, so at even greater risk of contracting the disease. So this is a typical 
scene. Um, and you can see none of these workers have masks. They don't have gloves. They don't have uh, protective covering for their clothes. Um, the, the clothes that they're wearing are probably clothes they put on every single day. They just, because they've got their own clothes underneath. Um, this poor fellow in the front here, you can see his hands are wet. So he's working in, um, you know, whatever, whatever is in here that he's dipping and cleaning the bones in. And it boggles the mind that the South African government allows this. These people are not told um, of the risk that they're putting themselves at. They're paid below minimum wages. Um, they're desperate for work. And um, who knows, you know, what they're taking back to their families. Um, for me, it's, it's a human rights issue. And, and um, I wish I had the time and the resources to actually to, to take that up as a, as a project. So if you think about it, handlers at the airports, inspectors, freight forwarders, they could potentially be at risk as well. Uh, David, science writer David Quammen's 2012 book, um, Spillover, Animal Infections and the Next Human Pandemic, traces the rise of different zoonoses around the world, including AIDS, Ebola, and SARS. And he says that one of the first questions that arise with any zoonosis pertains to the animal host. How is it being transmitted? If you haven't read this book, um, I know it was written in 2014, but it, it's a book that you really need to get to read. Uh, particularly in the light of COVID. I've been in touch with David Quammen, by the way, um, and um, I, I, I spoke to him about um, the whole fact that so many of our um, wildlife have been included as um, uh, now agricultural animals and can be used um, for meat and so on. And he was, he was quite horrified. He thinks that it's total madness. So all importing countries should familiarize themselves with the risk of continuing to support lion trophy hunting and the lion bone trade. In the light of the damage that COVID-19 has done to the world, in all good conscience, one cannot say that they didn't know while waiting for the next pandemic to arise. It's not a matter of if, but when. Once you know the risks, you cannot bury your head in the sand. To do the ethical thing, say no to the importation of land trophies and their body parts. Thank you, that's me done.